Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to our hearts this morning. <clears throat> May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O oh Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Excuse me, I'm not sure what's going on with my thread this morning. So if you remember uh, last week, I told you that one of the phrases our um, guide shared with us a lot um, was, let's situate ourselves, which has become my new favorite phrase. Are you, J Jerry and Donna, are you tired of hearing that phrase? They heard it a lot. It's become my new favorite. So we're going to situate ourselves again this morning. I'm going to share with you just a few pictures so we can figure out uh, where we are in the setting for um, our scripture passage this morning. So will you show the next the picture slide? So if you remember, this is the Sea of Galilee, and this is the, or the Sea of Gennesaret. You guys called it Gennesaret in the song. I was so proud. It was so exciting. So this is uh, the Sea of Galilee, and this is the view from uh, the city of Capernaum, which is where um, our story is this morning. It's one of my favorite pictures that we took, because I just love the Sea of Galilee. Can you go to the next one? So in the, um, in the town of Capernaum, this is the synagogue that still stands. The, um, the building that you see is from about the fourth century, um, the remains from the Byzantine era. But if you go to the next slide, oh no, that's the bigger view of it. And if you see the darker stones on the bottom, that's a town, the remains of a town that were all around the synagogue dating from the first century. So the next one. So if you'll see that um, stones at the top um, are the ones from the 3rd and 4th century, and the stones uh, at the bottom, which I just realized I gave you the bad picture, not the good one, but if you see the very bottom line, the stones are a little bit smaller, and those are the remains from the 1st century synagogue that Jesus would have been in, right where our story um, finds us. He's in the synagogue. Can you go to the next slide? I don't remember what, oh, there you see it. So the bottom, you see how the bottom stones are smaller and a different color than the top ones? That's the first century synagogue. So you go to the next slide. That's just another, I was a column that I thought looked really cool. I can't read what it says, but it looked fun. Go to the next one. Uh, this is all of us. We're standing inside the floor of the synagogue, so you can get an idea of how large it was. And those are just the walls from the fourth century. Next slide. This was um, part of a mikvah bath, one of the a ritual baths that they would have gone uh, in to cleanse themselves before any of the ho holy days. Go to the next slide. That's the town surrounding the synagogue. It's just stones, really. Next slide. So one of the um, things that we did uh, was we traveled to Nazareth, and in Nazareth they have built um, what they are, what they call the village of Nazareth, that's set up like a just like a first century town would have been. And so what you're seeing is a representation of what a first century synagogue would have looked like. It's important to know. Um, the function of a synagogue in Jesus' day. It, it wasn't like it is today, a place of worship, just like our churches. In the first century, the synagogue would have just been used as a place for teaching. It wasn't a place where they came um, to have a worship service necessarily. It was where they would come and the rabbi and the scribes would spend time teaching them um, all during the week. So that you can see the um, seats are all along the sides. It goes all the way in like a horseshoe shape, and then the, um, in the center there's a table that has scrolls on it, and that's where the teacher would have stood, so where Jesus would have stood in our story while he was teaching. I think there's one more picture of this that shows the guy standing, so he was pretending to be Jesus that day. So... Now we're situated. We understand where we are in Capernaum. It's, we're still in the area of Galilee. So Jesus last week had called the disciples. He had called Simon and uh, John, the sons of Zebedee, um, and Andrew. And now he has come to Capernaum in Mark and has begun his teaching. Mark is a very quick gospel. And he often calls Jesus a teacher. And that's what our very kind of first snippet of what Jesus is doing in his ministry here is of him teaching in the synagogue. But most of what Mark recalls for us in the gospel isn't his teaching. He tells us he's a teacher, but then leaves all the teaching portions out. He focuses on Jesus' actions, on what Jesus does. If we read the gospel of Matthew and Luke, which are both much longer than Mark, you'll um, hear and all the features of the longer sessions of 
sections of teachings, like the temple on the mount that in Matthew is like five chapters long. But Mark kind of skips most of that. He gives you the bare bones of his teaching, but focuses on what Jesus does. What matters most for Mark are Jesus' actions. So he's just called the disciples, and now he's begun teaching in the synagogue. Now what I want you to notice about Jesus in, in the last week's passage and in this one are the, the three instances that people are called, amazed, and transformed just by Jesus' words. He's not healing anyone by laying on of hands. He is simply using his words. In our passage from last week, you'll remember, he just says to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And Mark tells us immediately the disciples got up and went and followed him. Here in the beginning of our um, verses from Mark this week, he teaches and it says all of the people were amazed at what he taught. He commands the demon to release the man and the man is changed simply by the power of Jesus' words. As I told you a couple weeks ago when we passed out the stars, I believe that words have power. We know that words have power because in the very beginning of Scripture, in Genesis, one of the ways that God creates the world is to speak things into being. Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that it was good the first and the last day. We know that because of the Gospel of John, Jesus is called the Word. The Word came into the world. The world was God, and the Word was with God. But here's the thing, because we are also created in the image of God, we have that power too. Our words have the power to heal or the power to destroy. Mark is clear in his gospel about what Jesus' purpose is, to reclaim and redeem God's people. He is clear on Jesus' authority that it comes from God. In fact, a lot of these passages where it says specifically that the people were amazed at the authority with which he taught because he didn't teach like the scribes did, which was just to read something off of the scroll, he taught what those words really meant, what God was trying to tell them. Here's the thing. The words that we tell ourselves, the words that we listen to, the words that we hold on to, the words that we repeat have power over us and over the people around us. Many scholars now, when they're um, reading this passage and ones like it, equate uh, demon possession, this called it an impure spirit, but in other translations you'll hear it called that the man was possessed by demons. Most biblical scholars now equate that with mental illness. In 2012, the National Institute of Health said that there were an estimated 9.6 million adults who experienced a serious mental illness resulting in a disability. 43.7 million adults aged 18 or older in the U.S. had a mental illness that didn't necessarily result in a disability claim in that year. And here's the one that really got me. Just over 20%, or one in five children, either currently or at some point during their life, will have a seriously debilitating mental disorder. Think about that statistic for a minute. One in five children. Did you notice the number of children that were up here as we were doing the children's sermon? There were maybe about 10. Two of those children, at least, will have at some point during their life a seriously debilitating mental disorder. I could talk to you forever about the number of people I know, personally, family members, friends, parishioners from each of my churches who have struggled with some form of mental illness, depression, bipolar, anxiety, and on and on and on. I could share you, with you stories that would make you want to weep. And yet, we in the church as a whole rarely talk about it. I know just on the East Coast in the past two years, three pastors who have committed suicide. Three. Just that I know. So let's go back to what Jesus does here with this man. In two simple words, what Jesus does is deliver him. He didn't tell the man he was weak and to fight it off. He didn't ignore him or tell him to leave the synagogue because this was not the play time or place. Instead, using the power of his words, he frees him from the burden that he's been carrying. And our words can do the same. We can begin not to talk about mental illness like it's taboo or something that we can catch if we talk about it. Our words can change that. We can begin to talk about the ways we as a church can be a welcoming and safe space for those who are suffering. Our words can change that. 
We can begin to offer words of hope and solidarity, of love and grace, instead of talking about people like they are stupid or weak or worthless because they can't just get over their depression or anxiety. Our words can change that. So I want to invite you to join me today, and I, I want you to leave with these words. Your words matter. If the words in your head are telling you that you aren't worthy, that you aren't loved, that you aren't good enough to be a part of Christ Church, then we want you to come here so that we can tell you different words. If the words coming out of your mouth are hurting someone else, even accidentally, then come here so that you can learn how to speak words of life to one another. Together, let us follow Christ into this new year and let his words be shared so that all may be delivered. Thanks be to God. Amen.